So now I'd like to talk about self-management and mastering the competencies within that. And as we said before, there are four competencies within emotional intelligence, self-awareness, self-management, which then when you master those two can lead to you being able to master social awareness and of course relationship or social management. So the second building block is indeed self-management. And I think the best definition I have ever read about what actual self-management is, is the ability to act with intention. If only, right? If only the day that I could actually feel that I go through my day with intention, that nothing's provoking me, nothing's you know moving me around the chessboard of life, that I am actually making all of these decisions to act or not act on my own. I want to live to see that day that I can actually master that fully because it must feel incredible. But this is a critical competency because no one really wants to work for anyone who's emotionally volatile. Certainly, no one wants to collaborate on a team with anyone who's emotionally volatile. It's just too much work. And I think that might be a question that you might want to ask yourself down the road. How much work is it for other people to work with me? And if you find yourself sidestepping that answer, there's information to be gained by that. Self-management doesn't mean that you're never angry. Anger at times is called for. It can be a reasonable reaction, all right? But the key is to make sure that the emotion is not managing you, but you are managing the emotion, that you show enough control to keep things proportionate. Again, don't shoot a mouse with a cannon but then again, don't say everything's going to be fine when indeed we're in crisis mode and firm, confident response, even if there's an undertone of irritability, is what's called for in order to get everybody's attention because we are indeed in crisis. So there are six competencies that need to be mastered or worked through in order to get to a place of self-mastery for self-management. And the first one is emotional self-control. Again, if only. And that really does mean really knowing your triggers and when you do know those triggers, how to heal them, feel them, acknowledge them, but not act on them. And that is indeed the difference. So when you see somebody who's cool, calm, and collected, they look like, wow, I, I don't know if they actually feel the emotions that I do. Of course they do. Cool, Calm, and Collective is a wonderful veneer for self-management. Everybody feels exactly what they have always felt, but not necessarily to the same degree that it triggers them in a manner to act impulsively or in a way that they would prefer they hadn't. So self-management really requires emotional self-control at first so that you are not impulsive, but thinking through what your next step will be. Second competency is trustworthiness. And if you're a leader and you don't and you're not trustworthy, you have to rethink what you're doing there. Okay? Trustworthiness means consistency. Pure and simple. Are you consistently delivering a product that people can depend on? Trust means that even what, on a day that you think you're having your worst day, other people are accommodating of the situation because you have built equity in your brand. People know you for who you are. You have delivered a consistent brand. You have delivered on your word. You are responsible. You are accountable. You are truthful. You are loyal. All of the things that go into building your personal brand come under the heading of trustworthiness. Adaptability. And again, for those of us who have been in this industry since at least the mid-80s, adaptability is the name of the game, although I think some of us, myself included, have done this, you know, kind of kicking and screaming. But, you know, Darwin had it right. You either adapt or you die. And if you're someone who's wedded to the status quo, by the time you reluctantly decide to join in, uh, the bus might have left. 
you know, the, the time for you to catch up to where everybody else is might have meant that a door closes for you and that you really shot yourself in the foot. So adaptability is not having a plan B. Adopt adaptability means that your initial plan that you put so much heart felt work into and really were trying to develop all of a sudden got canned. And now you have to find the same enthusiasm for another total project, something going in maybe the opposite direction of what you thought you'd be doing. That's adaptability. Not going to plan B to get to the same goal, but having a different goal and getting to it with the same enthusiasm in which you embraced your first goal. And then, of course, conscientiousness. You cannot phone leadership in. All right, you cannot. You have to do the work. You have to show up. You have to leave your office. You have to do rounding. You have to know your people. You have to be as engaged in the little people as you are in the big people. You, you have to be someone who does the work all the time. And not that it's 24 seven, but that you know how to put a beginning, a middle, and an end to something so that you, with consciousness, are getting through a project to the desired outcome. And then optimism. It's an essential leadership factor. You cannot be you know, a pessimistic leader. I mean, I can hear you laughing as I'm saying this, because at times, Lord knows, you know, we, we've been given enough reason to feel a little pessimism. But you always have to be the type of person that can find something, something to latch onto in order to demonstrate to yourself and, of course, the people you are leading that this too shall pass. And once we get through this, everything will be fine. And that it's really cloudy now. But guess what? The sun is above those clouds, and it is going to come out again. So let's just hunker down and do what we have to do, and we'll do it together. And then initiative. The big difference between leadership and management, I think, is initiative in the sense of vision. You know, um, I, I really need to see this in leaders, that they have the initiative, the courage, the fortitude, if you will, to risk innovation, to risk seeing something differently, to risk saying, yeah, you know, I know that um, we conventionally hold our leadership retreat and we talk about skills and knowledge and skills and knowledge and skills and knowledge, but this time we're going to talk about emotional intelligence and it's going to be something that I insist on my staff that everyone develop their emotional intelligence the same way they've been developing their skills and knowledge. That is visionary. That is visionary. And that is innovative. And you will get a huge return on investment for that courage. So managing emotional triggers, not easy. You know, it, it, they, these triggers didn't happen overnight. Uh, they happened over time. And it's going to take some time to get in touch with them and then, of course, manage them. But you have to take responsibility for your own reactions. You, you, you cannot expect others to simply accommodate, condone, um, work around. It, it's just impossible in a leadership role to expect people to do that consistently. I mean, on occasion, we've all had a bad day, and thankfully, our, our good team has been around us. But consistently have to manage your reactions or work around your reactions or walk on eggs around you, that's unacceptable. So you need to decide you know, uh, that you're not going to be at the mercy of habitual behaviors the way you have in the past, that the things that have provoked you and that people have had to accommodate in you are now things that you are going to do on your own, that you are indeed going to turn, face the demon, if you will, and slay it. And you're going to get a handle on this. And you are going to be better and stronger and richer for it. All right. So you need to be aware of the 
emo the feeling, you know, building inside of your body. And we talked about stillness before, but I honestly um, don't know how else to share with you that it's, it's really something that I would strongly encourage so that you can get more in tune with the messages that your body is sending. So let me just throw this out there. Let me just say how many are suffering from migraine and how many of you are suffering from hypertension or irritable bowel syndrome. You know, those are not the necessary, you know, the, the, the consequences of a 30-year nursing career, although for some of us it seems like that's the way it's gone. Our body has been screaming at us, and we just haven't been listening. And it's time now, and at least we owe it to ourselves to do it now. It's never really quite too late, but also to share with our staff that the importance of sitting still and being introspective and quiet and trying to be more in your body, just simply breathing, feeling the aches and pains in your body, feeling the tenseness in your stomach, feeling how the back of your neck gets tight, feeling how you can you, the, the blood is rushing up your neck and into your face and you're getting beat red. But understanding that these are all messages that your body is telling you that you're reacting inappropriately to a trigger. And instead of pushing those aside and then exploding, really taking those as messages from a wonderful intuitive friend who is trying to say to you, do you hear me now? Stillness can offer you that. It can offer you the ability to tune into your body so that you get the messages that you're in a danger zone. And once you get that message, you can make a choice. You can either stay in the danger zone and do exactly what you've been doing, or you can act with intention. And you can do something very different. Surprise yourself and surprise the others who've been working with you. So again, in order to do that, you're going to have to be very, very compassionate with yourself. Um, your habitual behaviors, again, did not happen overnight, and they are not going to go away overnight, but they are going to lessen, and they finally will resolve. And, it, you know, the, the way this happens is usually, you know, you, you do something and you say, okay, I can't do that anymore, I got to stop. Great. And then the trigger happens again and you make the same mistake. But this time, instead of somebody saying to you, you, you can't do that anymore, you can self-correct and say, I just... I did it again, I'm, I'm gonna really be aware of this. And you start to slowly make incremental changes in yourself until finally the trigger happens and you don't respond. In fact, you respond in a way that you've always wished you could. And then the trigger happens and you're not responding apparently at all. In other words, it's almost like somebody put some kind of cover or barrier between you and that trigger. It just doesn't affect you the way it did. So celebrate small successes. Be very kind and humane to yourself. Get guidance if you need to. And please commit to a good self-care program while you're on this journey because this takes a lot of effort and strength to do it. So one of the things that's going to happen is you're going to bump up against some things that are bad memories and you wish to God if you could live it all over again you would do something so very different and there in that moment lies an opportunity for forgiveness and it's really no one else to forgive but yourself forgiveness is not directed at others True forgiveness means that you're not condoning anybody's bad behavior towards you or the fact that someone betrayed you or set you up or fired you or did a merger as an acquisition that left you out in the cold. That's not forgiveness. Forgiveness is taking all of that pain that you carried through in order to survive through that episode and putting it down and not carrying it around with you like some ball and chain, the baggage of your life, if you will. Forgiveness means I've decided not to relive this pain anymore in any shape or any form. Forgiveness means putting this down, thanking it for the lesson it has taught me, and moving on. 
and moving on with a sense of, I have survived, and now I'm going to live. I have survived, and now I'm going to start the next chapter of my life or my career free of the past, looking towards the future so that I can act with intent. So what's to be gained? Well, peace of mind. And I've often heard people say that, you know, peace of mind is priceless, and I absolutely agree. To be able to not be at the mercy of anything or anyone in controlling you and manipulating you into behaving in a manner that is less than you is a real gift. To really act with intent gives you clarity. You start to develop patience, this real sense of judgment about what I should do and when. When is this the time to retreat or is this the time to advance? You have a real sense of proportion and discernment as to and clarity about what's the actual next step. And you start to begin, you know, feel better physically. The migraines lessen, maybe your blood pressure is better controlled and Maybe your irritable bowel syndrome is even better managed. But you start to sleep better. And you certainly look better. And I promise you, you'll feel better. And as a leader, you can then step into one of the transformational aspects of leadership, which is role modeling. You can role model a better way of life for those in your department and those around you. So. One of the words in the human language, English language, that I hate is the word overwhelmed. I think it's a horrible mantra, and I hear us using it incessantly. I go down, I do rounds, how are you doing? Oh, we're so overwhelmed. How's things going? Oh, we're so overwhelmed. You know, and when I hear it from a leader, how's your team today? Oh, very overwhelmed. It, it's like fingernails on a chalkboard. Professionals don't become overwhelmed. When the situation gets tough, you stop, you rethink what you're doing, you reprioritize, you reorganize, and you restart. End of story. We do not have the luxury as professionals, let alone healthcare professionals, to become overwhelmed. We certainly cannot role model being overwhelmed to the people who we are leading, and certainly our patients and families it should expect and deserve better. But this comes from resilience, this comes from being self-aware, and this, become, this comes from self-managing so that you can act with intent and regardless of what shows up on any given day, you can handle it. Even if it means rethinking, reprioritizing, reorganizing, and restarting. That's what professionals do.